All right, then let's go to the reading and proclamation of God's word. We'll start with prayer. Holy Spirit, you are living and active. We trust the promise that you give us in the word that you are present wherever two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus. And so we trust Holy Spirit that you're present among us now when we're gathered in spirit, even if not in body. And we trust the promise Holy Spirit that you are also present within believers. And so we, we, we seek your presence within us. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, in the reading and the proclamation of the word. Be moving within us and among us. Open our ears and our minds and our hearts to hear and understand and believe the word that you give us today and move our lives to faithful obedience. We pray in the name of Jesus, who is the word made flesh. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16. I'm going to read verses 1 through 5 and then 13 through 26. Um, this story takes place just after the um, deliverance of the Israelites across the Red Sea out of slavery in Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elam. And Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and, and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there was on the surface of the wilderness a fine flaky substance, as fine as the frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each of you needs. An omer to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much as each of them needed. And Moses said, let no one leave it over until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it until the morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it as much as each needed. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, two omers apiece. When all the leaders of the congregation came to Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not become foul, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it on the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
And then the second reading from the Gospel of Matthew, this is a reading from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or your body or what you will wear. Is life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are they, are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying at a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they neither, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and then tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries enough of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as you probably know by now, we are on this sermon series about money. What are the money stories that inform our lives, the stories we get from our culture, from the world, from our families, and how do they compare with God's money story? We're looking at a few different threads of money stories. Maybe there's more than one. Probably there's more than one that's at play uh, in your life, but maybe there's one that's more dominant for you. Two weeks ago, we talked about the story that money equals status. It's a story that the world tells us um, that says our value and our belonging is measured by our wealth. That's not God's story. God says, because you are precious in my sight, I love you. We cannot buy our worth before God. It is a gift. Last week, we talked about the story that money equals power or control. The world tells us, um, it tells us if we have enough money, if you have enough money, then you can control your destiny. Maybe you can even control other people. He who has the gold makes the rules. That's not God's money story. God says, I am all powerful. I am the one in control and I cannot be bought. But here's the cool thing. God doesn't use God's power to control. God uses God's power to liberate his people, to set people free, and then invites us to choose to be in relationship with God. God doesn't control or coerce us. And God invites us not to see our money as a way to try to control our own futures or to control others. This week, I wanna look at a money story that is so prominent in our culture that it might even, you might even not realize that you believe it. It's like second nature. And that is the story that money equals security. The world says that the more money you have, the more you can feel secure and at peace. Is that a familiar story? If that's a dominant um, money story in your life, you might think about these questions to, to say, is that, is that a money story that drives me? The idea that I'm seeking security and peace through wealth. 
Um, so what might you ask yourself? Is having money in savings important to you? Do you like to make sure you have a cushion? Would you rather have extra money in the bank than some new purchase? When it comes to investing, do you prefer safer investing strategies with lower returns than high risk, high return opportunities? Do you stay up at night worrying about whether you have enough money, enough for whatever your goals might be? I think this is a money story that is so prevalent in our culture. And what, what really strikes me about it is this is a story of not enough. If we pursue money as our source of security and peace, we seem to always find ourselves coming up short. I don't have enough money to pay the bills. Or if I have enough money to pay the bills, I don't have enough to take a vacation and relax. Or if I have enough to take the occasional vacation, I don't have enough to pursue my dreams. Or I don't have enough to pay for college. Or I don't have enough to retire. The story of money as security is a story of not enough. And that impacts our giving, our ability to be generous. If we always feel like we don't have enough, we need just a little bit more. It's hard to be generous. But it's also a story that leads to a cycle of endless work. Work, 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 because we don't feel secure. And that's where I wanna to go to the Old Testament story. Here we have the Israelites in the desert. They've just had this miraculous liberation through a, a sea that splits for them. They're not in the desert that long before they start complaining because they're hungry. They're hangry, I like to think. I know how that feels. Not, not lost in a desert and hangry, but um, I get pretty grumpy when I'm hungry. So the Israelites are pretty grumpy and they're complaining. God hears them. God listens to their complaints. And God says, I'm going to send you bread every morning and quail every evening. I want to make sure my people are fed. But he gives them some instructions through Moses. He says, the people should only collect enough bread and enough quail for today. And on the sixth day, they can collect enough for two days because the seventh day is supposed to be a day of rest. You won't collect on the seventh day. Following these instructions, it requires an enormous amount of trust in God's provision. The Israelites have already been complaining, so we think that maybe their, their trust is a little shaky, right? And here God is asking them to trust every single day that God will provide again tomorrow. Don't store up for tomorrow because I'm going to bring you fresh bread tomorrow. But the Israelites have to trust that that will be true. And they fail at first. They try to keep a little extra. Well, you know, my family has eaten enough. I'm just going to save this little portion over here and we'll have it tomorrow just, just in case. It's their rainy day fund. The rainy day fund goes rotten. It's, it's no good the next day. And then they also try to gather, they try to save some of their, their um, so on, I'm sorry, on the sixth day, when they gather twice as much, they're allowed to do that and to save it for the Sabbath. So they don't have to go collect bread on the Sabbath. We didn't read this far in the story, but if you read the next paragraph, guess what they do on the Sabbath morning? They get up and they go out into the field and they look for more bread. And it's not there. But they've stored up enough from the day before. It takes the Israelites a little while. They do finally seem to get it. In fact, once they get it, at the end of this story, they take a container of this manna, this bread, and they put it in the box of the Ark of the Covenant, in with the Ten Commandments, the stone tablets. It seems to me like they know this is going to be a hard lesson to remember. And so they put this little jar of bread in with the Ten Commandments so that they can remember how God fed them in the wilderness. God is a God who 
who knows the needs of his people and who provides for them. Our job is to trust God's provision. In my own life, the story of that money equals security has often played out um, as Eric and I have made decisions together about our work and our life plans. Um, I'm the one in our family who has often wanted to make career or ministry uh, choices that look financially risky. Eric has generally been the responsible one. Uh, he's also the one, I should say, that pays our bills every month and uh, has some eye towards our, our future needs. I'm very grateful for that. But as we've tried to make these decisions and somehow at times had um, disagreements about what is the right thing to do, one of the questions that I've always wondered is just how much is enough to be comfortable? When can you take a risk? And I think that's one of the struggles of this story of money equals security is, um, there's always another level that you could aspire to, right? And it makes it, it hard to act in trust. This year, as you know, Eric and I did agree to take a risk. Um, I remember standing in front of the congregation uh, on a Sunday, I think in February, and telling you that um, Eric and I decided that he would leave his job to focus on our travel business and also to focus on some of his own career interests that were a little bit more entrepreneurial. Uh, and that was a huge step of faith for us, uh, a, mo a moment of saying, you know what, we don't know that this is all gonna work out. We don't know what the impact on our financial well being is going to be, but it feels like the right thing to do and at the right time to do it. Well, by most accounts, this probably seems like it, looking back, it should seem like a terrible decision. We had no idea in early February that by the middle of March, the whole world would be shut down and that no one would be traveling. If it's not a terrible decision, at least it was terrible timing, right? And we could look at it that way. But in reality, over the past seven months, that hasn't been our experience. Instead, this has been a time of growth and of grace for Eric and I. God has provided for our physical needs in ways that we never anticipated or imagined. And God is teaching us about peace that's not tied up in the number in your bank account. God is teaching us how to rest. It's not, it hasn't been uh, the most secure time, but it has been peaceful. We've known something of contentment and provision. And I am just phenomenally grateful and still a little surprised sometimes by that. Money equals security is a story that I have to unlearn, that we have to unlearn so that we can replace it with God's story of, of provision and care. If money equals security is part of your money story too, you may find yourself with the same kind of sleepless nights and um, obsessive attention to the numbers in your bank account, trying to buy peace. Most of us who have subscribed to that story though find, just like with the other money stories, that we cannot answer the question, how much is enough? It always feels that if we had just a little bit more, then we would be secure. Earlier in this pandemic, when Eric and I were, were going through our own sort of uh, learning in this, as we've been going through our own learning in this journey, um, I came across the quote and I saw it again this week. A false sense of security is the only kind there is. We can think we are secure. We can think we have everything um, all neatly accounted for but the truth is our lives can be perilous. The pandemic has taught us that and that our fate is really in God's hands. And so our peace can't come from the values of our bank account. And that's where I wanna to turn to this story, the parable or the um, Sermon on the Mount and what it has to say to us about security. This story doesn't uh, 
promise us that everything will be fine. The story ends by saying, tomorrow will bring enough worries of its own. So it doesn't mean we won't ever have anything to worry about, that everything will always be perfectly secure. But what it offers us is it, des it describes the way God cares for the birds and the grass. It offers a picture of trust of trusting that God will provide what I need when I need it. It offers a picture of contentment, of learning to say that what I have is enough and not continually seeking after more. It offers a picture of peace, of being able to say, I can rest. And all of that comes not because of the numbers in our bank account or our retirement accounts, it comes because we believe in the provision and the care of God that, can, that money cannot buy. Trust, contentment, and peace because we serve a God who knows our needs and cares for them. A God who invites us into a relationship where we trust God, where we rest from our labors, where we find contentment in the gifts that God has given us. And when we live into God's money story of provision and care, of trust and contentment and peace, we find ourselves liberated, liberated to take those risks in faith, liberated to give generously because we know that God will provide our needs. I've seen it at Elliott Church in this pandemic. God has showed up again and again. I was afraid at the beginning what are we going to do? Is the church going to be able to pay its bills? But God has provided for us in just unexpected ways through this pandemic. And I am so grateful for that. And so I hope that you too can live into this, this trust, this trust that God cares for you, that God will provide for your basic needs, but also provide for your future. And that it can set you free to be generous and joyful and at peace. May it be so, Elliot Church. Amen.